Eh, hoy eh, tenemos el, el gusto de tener al, al, al profesor Fan Liao, que como ven ustedes, no sé, necesito decirlo, es un eh, joven profesor de eh, el Instituto de Derecho Internacional de la Academia eh, China de Ciencias Sociales de Pekín. Él con todo y su juventud está eh, preparado para um, tratar asuntos de derecho económico internacional. Podemos decir acá entre nos que es eh, la, así que me va a entender que es de, la nueva, de las nuevas generaciones de, de profesores chinos que de alguna manera sirven como punta de lanza en a nivel internacional. El Instituto de Derecho Internacional de la Academia de, de Ciencias eh, es uno de los institutos más fuertes, eh, podemos decirlo, de, de, toda, de, toda, de, toda, de toda China. Y evidentemente la Academia de Ciencias China eh, tiene una parte del prestigio eh, tiene una gran tradición en investigación eh, jurídica. Entonces, eh, esto como parte de, de proyectos de investigación que tiene el Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas y también le agradezco al, al profesor, colega, el doctor Ricardo Méndez Silva, que es el jefe del área de Derecho Internacional, que también nos eh, esté con nosotros. Pero volviendo sobre el profesor eh, Liao, eh, él, él trata un, un tema que es de, de gran importancia, evidentemente ustedes lo van a escuchar, eh, que es precisamente eh, las tendencias de la reestructuración del Fondo Monetario Internacional. Eh, platicando con él, me decía, por ejemplo, si ustedes eh, vieron en el... Eh, en el affair último de la presidencia del Fondo Monetario Internacional, donde hoy nuevamente Strauss-Kanz eh, es eh, objeto de, de, de las primeras planas de los periódicos, eh, y donde, como sabemos, eh, salió de la, de la presidencia del Fondo Monetario Internacional, eh, en esta escaramuza y... y reestructuración, digamos, en la dirección eh, China ocupa un lugar en el eh, Fondo Monetario Internacional. Bueno, y de eso, de eso, de eso, de eso trata un tanto su conferencia, no exactamente de este afer, sino del funcionamiento del Fondo Monetario Internacional y las posibilidades de eh, transformación, eh, de lo cual les digo es interesante por venir de una posición de un, de un país que tiene una emergencia eh, impresionante y una presencia eh, igual en las relaciones internacionales. Eh, pues, eh, en principio, eh, le damos la bienvenida al profesor eh, Fan Liao y eh, le damos la palabra. Eh, ¿Cómo vamos a, a, a funcionar eh, el... Eh, él va a dar su, su conferencia, eh, la va a dar en inglés. Eh, tenemos eh, la traducción de una parte de ella. Desgraciadamente, la conferencia apenas nos no las dio ayer y no tuvimos tiempo de hacer toda la traducción. Pero eh, después de eso haremos unos comentarios sobre ella y abriremos, eh, la, abrimos, abriremos el espacio para preguntas y respuestas. Eh, eh, vamos a tener una, una cooperación por parte del compañero eh, Diego en la traducción. So oh, we are going to, to start. You're welcome at the institute. Thank you very much for being here. And this is your time. Um, thank you, Dr. Tetera. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, 
really a great pleasure for me to be here to uh, sit in the uh, Institute of uh, Legal Research of NAM, which is uh, the best university not only in Mexico, but also in the whole uh, Latin America region. Uh, my sincere thanks goes to Dr. Becerra for his invitation and for his kind treatment since I'm, I came here uh, the day before yesterday. He made me really feel at home. And my thanks also goes to uh, Diego for his excellent uh, assistance, uh, not only the communication work, but also uh, what he has done since I came here. Uh, yesterday, uh, Diego uh, uh, drove me to the uh, wonderful places, the National Museum of uh, Anthropology and also the Main Square. Um, I was really astonished by the splendor of these places. And, and, and I even had a picture with the old gentleman uh, on the main square who was performing the founding father of uh, Mexico, Mr. Hidalgo. Uh, this experience is really fascinating for me. And I was so excited yesterday that I didn't actually didn't sleep well last night. So uh, if I make any stupid mistakes during my presentation, I beg for your uh, pardon in, in advance. Um, now, uh, let's get down to the business. Today, I'm going to talk about the reform of the International Monetary Organization, or the IMF. Uh, I think uh, you should not be strange with this uh, organization, because as uh, early as in the 1990s, when uh, Mexico was experiencing the uh, peso crisis, uh, uh, IMF stepped in and uh, lent money to the country. Uh, of course, with uh, strict or even rigid conditions attached to the loans. Uh, we, that is the so-called conditionality of the uh, IMF loans, which is uh, uh, not within the topic of today's presentation. And a more recent uh, event might be of more interest to you. That is uh, uh, your central banker, the president of uh, the Bank of Mexico, Mr. Augustine Cousins ran for the uh, presidency, or more accurately, the position of the managing director of the IMF. Uh, unfortunately, he lost his title against the French lady, Miss Christine Lagarde, who was uh, who is now the uh, managing director of the IMF. I I'm going to talk a little about the uh, uh, selection of uh, of uh, uh, IMF high officials later in my presentation. Okay, now um, I'm going to uh, first talk a little about the background of, uh, of uh, the uh, MF as a uh, precondition for, for the talk about the re reform. The International Monetary Fund, the MF, is one of the most important international organizations uh, and arguably the, the single most important international financial organization together with the World Bank uh, in the whole world. It was established by the Bretton Woods Conference towards the end of the Second World War in 1944 as a response to the collapse of the international monetary system uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, which uh, crisis partly contributed to the rise of uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany and the breakout of the World War II. At the time of its uh, formal establishment in 1945, the IMF was essentially jointly operated by two uh, countries across the Atlantic, with, that is the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, now, there has been more than two thirds of a century since the establishment of uh, IMF, and during the nearly 70 years, uh, many things have Heightened and many changes have occurred. Uh, I'll uh, list some of the changes as an example. Uh, first, United States and the United Kingdom, the two countries that decisively shaped the post war institutions, they no longer uh, hold a virtual monopoly on international economic policy making. Uh, continental European countries that were occupied enemy or neutral countries at the time of the Bretton Woods Conferences in 1944, they have emerged as major participants 
in economic di diplomacy, either through the European Union or in their own rights. And the uh, spectacular rise, first of Japan, then of China, has made those countries essential parties in trade and monetary negotiations. Other Asian, uh, Asian countries such as India, Korea, and the members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, are now also major economic actors. Key countries of Latin America, such as Brazil, Mexico, Chile, have also taken off with market-oriented growth strategies. And with the end of the Cold War, Russia and the countries of the former Soviet Union have also successfully rejoined the world economic system. And with these general trends, in particular, the rise up in recent years of the so-called dynamic emerging market economies uh, represented by the BRICS countries. Uh, first, is, uh, the BRICS four, that is Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, India, and China, and so-called BRICS four. And uh, at the end of last year, South Africa was invited by BRICS four to be part of this uh, uh, system. So now BRICS four became has become uh, has become uh, BRICS, uh, BRICS five, uh, with the S uh, changed from a lowercase into a patch, uh, into uppercase. Now it's BRICS five. With the BRICS countries, they have made it clear to the world that it is no longer the time when developed countries themselves can decide for the rest of the globe. Um, as an example, after the breakout of the global uh, global financial crisis. Uh, in 2007 and 2008, the once liberating Group of 20, uh, which was established uh, after the breakout of the Asian financial crisis in 1997, the Group of 20, uh, which had been for uh, more than one decade, after this global financial, uh, financial crisis, um, it has rise up, uh, and in which both China and Mexico are important members. This Group, group of 20 has become much more active and played a leading role in managing the crisis and reforming the global financial system. This is the example of the rise up of the emerging market economies. However, despite of the change and the changing international setting, various systems and mechanisms of the IMF have not been reformed and adjusted um, uh, in a timely manner this has contributed to its incapability of maintaining financial stability and coping with financial crisis in recent years. And it has affected its authority and effectiveness as a leading international organization. Uh, the G20 summit held since 2009, uh, it's now five summits have been held. Uh, the summits have explicitly recognized the defects and the shortcomings of the international monetary system led by the IMF and called for substantial reforms. And in my opinion, among the issues, among the many issues demanding reform, uh, code shares, voting power, and governance structure uh, stand out sharply, especially for developing countries and uh, emerging economies. These are the, uh, some of the most important issues that need to be addressed by the IMF and by the rest of the world. Um, this is a brief introduction to the background of the reform of the IMF and also to my presentation. And in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, okay, my, the rest of my presentation would be divided into several parts. First, I'm, go I'm going to uh, talk about the shortcomings or insufficiencies of the existing system in terms of uh, uh, code affairs, voting power, and uh, a governance structure of this organization. And after that, I'm going to talk about uh, the recent reforms taken already by the organization for, uh, uh, in terms of these uh, fields. Uh, many are with instruction to the two important resolutions passed by the IMF uh, Board of Governors in 2008 and 2010 uh, 
respectively. And after that, I will discuss the achievements and insufficiencies or limitations of the uh, reforms measures already taken and give some suggestions as a concluding uh, remark. Uh, first, let's take a look at uh, the, some of the insufficiencies of the existing IMF system in terms of its quota shares, voting power, and uh, uh, governance structure. First, let's look at uh, uh, some problems with the quota and the voting power system within the IMF. Uh, unlike other major international organizations, such as the United Nations, or the World Trade Organization, WCO, IMF has not adopted the one country, one vote principle as a symbol of sovereign equality. Uh, in some sense, it is more like a company limited by shares uh, in the sense that the voting power of a member in IMF is determined by its shares or quota in the organization. Uh, put it simple, the more quota you hold, the louder voice you have. Uh, as this, uh, it, it works like this. At the starting point, each member has 250 basic votes. Um, and beyond that, beyond the 10, uh, 250 votes, basic votes, you get an additional vote for every, for every 100,000 uh, special drawing rights, which is the measurement of uh, of uh, your share in the uh, MF. For every 100,000 SDRs, the country has attributed to the MF. And the sum of the basic votes and the quota votes will be the total votes the country holds in the IMF. We can take a look, take a look at uh, the quotas and votes of uh, three countries, as an example, in IMF. Uh, United States, uh, the single biggest country in the uh, uh, IMF, it has a quota of four, actually, uh, 42,122.4 million of SDRs, which occupies more than 17% of the total quota shares of the IMF. And the number of votes is 421,965 votes, which amounts to more than 16% of the total votes of in the IMF. What does that mean? What does more than 16% votes uh, mean to an uh, organization like IMF? I will talk about uh, I will um, discuss that later. And China, uh, uh, at the current stage, it has uh, uh, its quotas occupies four percent of the total quotas uh, in IMF, and which gives it uh, 3.81 percent of the total votes in in the, in the organization. And Mexico, uh, 1.52 percent of the total quotas, and 1.47 uh, percent of the total votes. This is an example uh, of how this uh, uh, voting system works in in uh, in MF. Um, here at my presentation, I'm not going to question the so-called weighted voting approach itself. It has its historical reasons and perhaps also practical needs, just as, as we all know, the veto power enjoyed by the five, five permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations. So I'm not going to uh, uh, challenge this uh, weighted voting system itself uh, today. Uh, but, but even if we take this system for granted, we take this for granted, uh, we still have to ask whether the distribution of shares, whether the distribution of shares is proper and fair for
for the distribution of, uh, distribution of shares directly determines the total votes of a member. Uh, with this uh, observation, we go to the so-called quota formulas of, of uh, the NF. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, neither the NF articles of agreement nor the uh, executive board has, uh, uh, which, which is the daily decision-making body of NF, neither of the articles of uh, agreement of NF nor the executive board has formally adopted any particular method for determining quotas or quota increases. Uh, no such formal rules. But, but over the years, the IMF has developed quantitative, some quant quantitative criteria or so-called formulas to calculate the quotas, to calculate the quotas, which help determine the initial quota for new members and also serve as a guide in determining adjustment quotas for existing members. The, the initial quota, uh, so-called Britain Woods formula, was adopted in 1944 at the Britain Woods Conference uh, to determine the, the initial quotas for the 45 original members of the IMF. We can have a look at this uh, so-called Britain Woods formula. Uh, basically, this formula contains the following uh, four or five variables. First is the national income of a country, of a member country, as a measure of a country's economic size and ability to contribute to IMF resources. And second is the uh, country's international reserves, gold, foreign reserves, something like that. It is also a measure of a country, uh, of a country's capacity to finance IMF operations, because IMF its lending resources come, uh, come from its member countries. But international reserves have a smaller weight than the uh, national income. And third, it's uh, merchandise import as an indicator of possible need to use IMF resources. And fourth, it's the variability of exports with a high weight to reflect vulnerability to internal trade shocks that could lead to a possible need for IMF resources. And finally, it was a multiplicative factor that increased the role of exports uh, relative to national income in the determination of calculated quotas. Um, what's the problem with this, uh, with this uh, uh, Britain Woods formula? Because it looks, I mean, beautiful. Uh, on, on, on face, uh, nothing improper. But, but, we further analysis would tell us more. Although the use of a formula provided a statistic base to the process of determining uh, quotas, the selection of the relevant uh, factors, the relevant variables, the relevant criteria, and the weights, the different weights assigned to these factors reflected preconceived notions about the overall size of IMF and the relative economic size of members, of the members. Judging from its effects, which I will uh, discuss a little bit later, the distribution of quota shares based on the Britain Woods formula is in the best interest of traditional developed countries. I will give an example later. Um, the NF made some minor changes to the Britain Woods formula in 1963 and 1983, uh, respectively. But these, uh, uh, ch these changes, these amendments, did not alter its basic structure, didn't alter the basic structure of the formula. Of the formula. Uh, basically, um, the amendments in 1963 and 1983 introduced four alternative formulas uh, to the uh, Britain Woods formula, uh, which I, I will not discuss in detail, but it is quite technical. And they replaced the national income with the more recent concept GDP, general domestic product. They replaced the national income concept with the GDP concept. And, and they expand, expanded the international reserve to cover some new things uh, 
emerged after the uh, uh, initial formula, such as the SDRs, special drawing rights, which was introduced in the 1970s uh, to as a new type of international reserve. And also, they extend the international reserve concept to cover the European monetary unit, which, is, which was the predecessor of the euro today. However, as I said just now, the basic structure of the Britain Woods formula remains unchanged. Okay, I will give an example of why this formula, this formula, uh, with its uh, selection of of the factors and it, the weights assigned to these factors are in the best interest of traditional developed countries. Um, let's take uh, the GDP, which is the single most important uh, factor in the formula, which, ca which carries the most weight. Let's take this for example. I've got a table. Um, this is a statistic of of the uh, of the votes that six six countries held in the executive board of IMF uh, in 2001, and uh, their GDP value in market exchange rates and purchase, uh, purchasing. Uh, uh, a purchasing power parity uh, measured by, uh, by the market exchange rate and purchasing power parity in 2008, uh, in 2000, and also of its population. Let's take a look at these uh, figures. Basically, the six countries are actually they, they can be divided into two groups. Group uh, Group one is uh, traditional developed. European developed countries, uh, which are Belgium, Italy, and Holland. And group two, uh, developing countries, or more accurately, emerging market economies, which include Brazil, China, and India. And in the Britain Woods formula, um, the GDP, as the most important uh, factor, is measured based on uh, market uh, a market exchange rate, a market exchange rate, that is how your, your currency is exchanged in the market, say um, $1 equals to uh, 12 pesos, uh, $1 equals to uh, 6 something RMBs, based on the market exchange rates, and not based on the so-called person power parity. It's not based on person power parity. Uh, the basic idea of the person power parity is that uh, one single item, uh, the same item, the same merchandise should be sold at the same price across the world. Um, uh, no matter if it's in the United States, in Mexico, in China. So it's a different kind of measurement of, of the uh, purchasing power of the currency. You can see, you can see that uh, the total votes of the three developing countries, Belgium, Italy, Holland, is um, 168,981 in 2001. And the total votes of uh, the two, of the three emerging market economies are, I mean, are 130, 1, 1, 136,385 votes in 2001. But let's take a look at the GDP value, uh, the GDP valued both by MERs and by PVP. If valued by uh, market exchange rates, the total GDP of the three developed countries is 1,690 billion in 2008. And the three Emerging market economies, their total GDP is 2,077 billion in 2000. 
But if we change the measurement method, we use the PPP as the measurement method, then we can see the big difference. The total votes, or the total GDP of the three developed countries is 2,005 and 158 billion. But the three de uh, developing countries now has, uh, have a GDP of 9,442 billion uh, US dollars. US dollars. And, and we can take a look at the, the population of the two groups of countries, which also are uh, different, differentiated sharply. What does these figures mean? What does these figures mean? Um, when, when the GDP is calculated on the basis of market rate, uh, on, on the basis of the market exchange rates, I'm sorry, when the GDP was measured by GPT, uh, GPT, uh, then the total GDP of the three developing countries is almost four times higher than the three developing countries. But if measured by market exchange rates, the margin is only 23%. And the total votes of the three emerging market economy were even 19% fewer than the three developing countries. That's an example of how this calculation method of this Britain Woods formula is biased against, uh, biased in favor of uh, traditional developed countries. And, and how, and what were the results of this um, biased or unfair calculation method? What's the result, what was the result? A remarkable result of this uh, unfair quota formula, of this unfair calculation, is that it results in the over-concentration of quota and voting shares in developing countries. Most notably, before the reform in 2008, the United States alone holds around 17% of the total quota and the votes in the IMF. As will be discussed below, this gives the United States a de facto veto power in on the significant issues uh, in the IMF. Also, if taken as a whole, the European Union countries hold nearly 30% of the total veto power, uh, the, the total votes in the organization, which is uh, quite disproportionate to its actual economic position in the world economy. As appointed by the IMF itself, we know that decision-making at the IMF is not based on the principle of one country, one vote, but, quotation marks, was designed to reflect the position of each member country in the global economy, then the distribution of voting shares must be reformed to uh, quotation marks, reflect the larger role that emerging markets and developing economies now play in, in the world economy. So this is a brief introduction to the uh, unfair or biased quota formula, the calculation method of the quota share and the voting powers in the IMF. And another uh, insufficient or defect of the uh, voting system is the de facto veto power of the United States and the diluted basic votes of the countries. Of the countries. Uh, to better understand the de facto veto power of the United States and IMF, let's first take a look at uh, some, uh, at some uh, fundamentals of the uh, voting voting method uh, in, in, in the organization. Uh, basically, issues uh, in IMF or decision-making uh, in IMF in, in the Board of Governors are, are made uh, through, uh, I mean, different voting approaches 
uh, some of the issues are decided by a simple, a simple majority vote, which means if you get more than 50 votes, you can let the decision be made. And some other issues, they can only be decided or resolution be passed with a so-called special majority vote, uh, which is, means you have to have more than 50 uh, votes, uh, a percentage set higher than, than the 50% vote to get things done. And within the so-called special majority vote, we have a seven special majority vote and 85 uh, mo uh, special majority votes, depending on how important the issues to be decided are. Uh, basically, basically, uh, uh, for, I learned from the articles of, of agreement of the IMF, there are 21 types of issues, 21 types of issues that require a 70% majority vote, which mainly relates to IMF's operations and the transaction. And there are another 18, 18 types of issues which require a more rigid uh, majority, which is 85, 85 uh, majority votes. These kind of issues uh, mainly cover IMF's fundamental functions, organizational structure, uh, members, legal status, and significant operations. For example, for example, the adjustment of quotas, the sale of IMF gold reserves, the balance of payment assistance to developing countries, and uh, the allocation of SDRs, these important issues had to be decided with a 85 special majority. And with this, we come to the de facto power of the United States. As has been discussed just now, the United States is the single, as a single member of the IMF, it holds more than 17 of the total quotas of the organization and more than 16% of the total votes of the organization. What does this mean? What does this mean? It, it means it mean that on the really important issues, on those issues that require a 85% uh, special majority vote to decide, uh, the United States, as a single member, can prevent these decisions being made, can prevent any resolution from being passed. That, that is the meaning of the de facto veto power of this country in organization. It is called de facto veto power um, because there's no formal recognition or any provision in the IMF articles of, of agreement or bylaws to give such a veto power to, to the country. But, but by operation of these uh, relevant uh, mechanisms, it, the, this country, the United States, actually gets a de facto veto power on really significant issues. Uh, this is about the de facto veto power. And also, if you, if you remember, I mentioned just now that as a starting point of the voting system, uh, each country has uh, 250 basic votes, uh, which is re uh, unrelated to its uh, shares or its uh, uh, economic uh, strength uh, in, in, in the IMF. And what has happened to, to this to this basic votes since the foundation of uh, IMF? What has happened to it? Um, actually, actually, at, at the time of the establishment of the IMF, the basic votes, the basic votes, uh, amount to 11.3 percent of the total votes in IMF. But ever since that, uh, by means of uh, two lines of development, this percentage, the basic votes, have significant, significantly been diluted. Diluted. Uh, what are these two lines of development? development? First, first, um, with the several times of general quota increases, the percentage of basic votes and the total votes have been greatly decreased from the 11.3% at the time of establishment 
to just 2.1 percent um, now. Now, this is um, I'm sorry for that to, to turn to PPT. Um, uh, this is a, a, a direct way of, of uh, dilution uh, to the basic votes. And another way of dilution to the basic votes is um, by, the amend, by the amending the uh, articles of, of agreement of the IMF, um, the issues requiring a special majority vote to decide has been significantly increased from nine types of issues as establishment of the organization to uh, 18, to 18 types of issue when the Articles of Agreement, uh, agreement was first amended in 1968 and further increased to 99 after the second revision of the Articles of, of Agreement in 1976. And according to some scholars, these, these two, the two amendments, the two terms of increase, are meant to give the European countries and the United States a, a means to offset the uh, influence of the basic votes of, uh, of the uh, uh, developing countries. And as we, as we said just now, the basic vote is a, some kind of symbol of the sovereign equality and to shift the, uh, the uh, function of, of the weighted uh, uh, voting approach. But with the dilution uh, of the basic votes, the role of this uh, mechanism has significantly uh, decreased. I, I guess now it has only a minimal effect uh, against the uh, quota votes. And basic vote is also a focus of reform in 2008 and 2010 uh, resolutions. I will discuss it later in my presentation. Now we have seen some of the uh, insufficiencies, some of the defects in, in the uh, allocation or the distribution of uh, quota shares and uh, the uh, decisive veto power enjoyed by the United States and the dilution of the basic votes, which are uh, uh, some kind of uh, symbol of the uh, sovereign quality. Now let's get to another uh, part of, of the insufficiencies of, of the, uh, the MF, that is its uh, governance structure. Some of the defects, some of the shortcomings in the governance structure of this organization. Uh, first, let's take a look at the executive board of this uh, organization. Uh, the governance structure of IMF, uh, as I said just now, it mimics a company limited by shares with the board of governors as the highest decision-making body, like the, the uh, uh, shareholder, shareholders meeting, and with the executive board elected by the board of governors to take, take care of the daily business of IMF which is uh, much more, uh, much like the board of directors for a company, and a, managing, a management under the leadership of the managing director elected by the executive board. And the management is responsible for conducting the ordinary business of IMF under the direction of the executive board. Basically, the governance structure has these two uh, three tiers. Now let's take a look at the uh, uh, executive board. What power? What powers it has, and how are these powers uh, exercised? According to the articles of, of agreement of the NF, all powers under the agreement not conferred directly on the board of governors the executive board or the managing director shall be vested in the board of governors. But the board of governors may delegate to the executive board the authority to exercise any of its powers 
except those conferred directly by the agreement on the Board of Governors. Um, in, in practice, the Board of Governors has delegated most of its powers to the Executive Board, most of its powers to the Executive Board, and only retains the right to approve, quote, interests, SPR allocations, the admission of new members, compulsory withdrawal of the members, and amendments to the articles of agreement and bylaws. Uh, uh, except for these uh, 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 issues, or other powers actually in practice has been delegated by the Board of Governors to, to the Executive Board. So the Executive Board has the real sense of power, the daily decision-making body of the MF, um, it has huge powers um, and can decide um, a lot of things. And this board, the executive board, is made up of 25, only 25 executive, uh, executive directors. Among these 25, uh, 24, sorry, 24, among these 24 executive directors, five are appointed by the five members, which have the largest supporters in the organization. These five countries are United States, Japan, Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. And the remaining 19 executive directors are elected by the remaining members, uh, member states, elected by the remaining member states. And these remaining member states, they are divided into 19 groups divided into 19 groups. Now, how are these groups uh, organized? It's basically based on, on, a, on a voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, uh, choice. Uh, it might be organized according to the geographical uh, location of these countries, but it's not required. It's not required, countries are not required to do so. It's totally on a voluntary basis. For example, then, then um, it's not in, uh, Adding European constituency, but it's within Latin American countries uh, form a constituency. So then with, uh, with Latin American countries. And also Israel, Israel, or, uh, although, I mean, in geographical terms, they are bordered with uh, the Middle East uh, Muslim countries, but they actually, Israel has formed a constituency with uh, former Soviet Union countries. So it's, it's certain on a voluntary basis. And, uh, apart from the five, uh, appointed uh, executive directors, the 19, uh, remaining 19 directors are selected by the 19 constituencies formed by the remaining member countries on a voluntary basis. And the executive board normally makes decisions based on consensus. Normally they make decisions based on consensus, but Formal uh, votes, uh, uh, formal voting are sometimes uh, taken. And they, ha they have the choice of a formal voting, but generally they make decisions on the basis of consensus. Um, uh, and due to the different number of states in a given constituency, in a given uh, one of the 19 constituency, and there are different voting powers in the, uh, these countries. Each elected executive director represents a different percentage of total votes, ranging from 1.56% to 4.92%, uh, different percentage of, uh, of the total votes. And what's the problem with uh, the executive board with its composition? What's the problem with it? Uh, similar to the distribution of quotas and votes uh, we discussed just now, the major problem with the executive board is the imbalance of power between developing countries and developing countries. Uh, currently, among 19 elected ex executive directors, five are from developed European countries, which are Belgium, Holland, Italy, Denmark, and Switzerland and two are from Canada, uh, uh, Canada and Australia, and two from the OPEC countries, which are Saudi Arabia and Iran, and the rest ten from emerging markets and developing countries, which are China, Brazil, India, Russia, Thailand, Egypt, Chile, Argentina, 
Lesotho and Togo. Uh, 19, uh, the 19 elected directors, they are from these different countries. And remember, I said just now that five uh, uh, directors are directly appointed by the five largest shareholders of the IMF. And if we take these five countries into consideration, then on the surface, on the surface, developing countries and developing countries uh, as two group, uh, each have uh, 12 directors on the board, of, on the executive board. So on the, on, on, the, on the face, I mean, the two group of countries uh, run neck to neck uh, in, on, on the board. But if we go with some further analysis, we can find more. Uh, 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 can tell us more. Uh, first, European developing countries have eight directors, eight directors on the board, accounting for one third of the total number of directors, which is far too disproportionate to their actual position in the world economy. And second, um, this uh, uh, decision making process in the executive board as, we, as uh, similar to the uh, decision making in the board of governors is not based on one director, one vote. It's not based on this principle. It's also based on the actual votes, actual votes that the countries behind the director has in the organization, in organization. So what does that mean? The more votes you represent, the more voting power you represent, you represent the more, the louder your voice in the executive director. Even if the decision-making process is not based on, on a, a formal voting, it's based on the consensus uh, approach, still, still, the United States, the European Union countries with more votes, with more voting power, with more directors, they definitely will have more influence or, or in an advantageous position on the executive board. That's the problem with this uh, daily decision-making body of the IMF. And if we, if we look at the management or the senior officials of, of the uh, IMF, we can, have, we can find similar problems we can have similar problems. Um, actually, the articles of agreement only provide that the managing director or the head of the IMF shall be elected by the executive board and that the managing director shall not have, shall not be a governor or an executive director and just make this provision without attaching any geographic conditions to the, to the selection of of the managing director. However, since the establishment of the MF, the managing director has always been Europeans, has always been Europeans without exception. And the first deputy managing director has always been Americans, always been Americans. Uh, um, by American, I mean a citizen of the United States. Um, even if such an arrangement might have some historical justification in the uh, uh, immediately post-war era when the actual, I mean, uh, only in the United States and the European countries uh, actually have, have uh, a meaningful exercise of, of, of powers at that time. Uh, even if it ha may have some historical justification in, in, at that time, it is increasingly inconsistent with the international economic reality, not to mention the fundamental principle of democratic politics, that, that the uh, monopoly of, uh, of the uh, position of, uh, of the highest uh, official of this organization. And also, the lack of transparency in the selection process of the managing director and the other high officials of uh, this organization is also a big, big problem because there's just no specific rules governing the selection of, of the high officials in IMF. There's just no such rules, such written rules, principles, no. And also, there are 
not many personnel in IMF management and staff, which are from uh, developing countries, and most of them are from the developed, developed countries. This is also a uh, uh, big problem with with uh, the governance structure of the in, with of the, uh, the IMF. So, with all these insufficiencies, with all these defects, with all these problems, what should we do, or what has been done uh, on the part of the IMF? Uh, actually, as a result of the global financial uh, tsunami and the mounting calls from the developing countries for a more balanced IMF, the Board of Governors have tasked to in our milestone resolutions in 2008 and 2010, making significant changes to its distribution of quotas and governance structure. Um, since both resolutions involve amendments to the articles of agreement, uh, in addition to the approval of the Board of Governors, they need to be accepted by uh, three-fifths of the members, which hold Eight, at least 85% of the total voting power to take effect. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, any amendment, any amendment to the articles of, of agreement of IMF, which is its constitution, any amendment to these articles of agreement, uh, besides being passed by the Board of Governors, it has it has uh, to be accepted by by uh, a qualified number of members with a qualified number of votes. So that's actually two steps: a resolution passed by the board of governors and acceptance by qualified number of members with qualified number of votes. Uh, currently, the IMF has 100 and. 87 members, which means that the two resolutions need to be accepted by at least 113 members holding at least 85% uh, of the total voting power. Uh, it was not until, since these are, actually these requirements are quite, uh, I mean, uh, a strict requirement, it was not until March 2011, March this year, that the 2008 resolution took effect with the uh, Czech Republic accept the amendment as the 113th uh, member. Uh, and the 2010 resolution is yet to be accepted by the qualified number of members. And the expectation of the, of the executive board is that the resolution should take effect uh, and for, uh, for the relevant uh, reforms contained in it to, ca to be carried out before the 2012 IMF annual meeting, that is, next year. We'll see if it can be uh, uh, accepted uh, on time. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at the major contents uh, of these two resolutions. First, let's look at, take a look at the uh, 2008 resolution. Uh, the first part of the 2008 resolution is to increase the quota shares of the emerging market economies. Uh, actually, this uh, part of the reform dates, dated back to 2006, uh, the 2006 IMF annual meeting in Singapore. Uh, on that meeting, the Board of Governors decided to, decided to begin a two-step reform. The first step was to increase on an individual basis the quotas of the four most underrepresented member states, uh, that is China, Mexico, South Korea, and Turkey. And the total increase of quotas were, uh, was uh, 4 billion SDRs. Uh, so to, to specify, the quota, in, the quota percentage of China was increased from uh, 2.98% to 3.72% and a vote, vote percentage from 2.94% to 3.65%. Uh, the quota percentage of Mexico uh, was increased from 1.21% to 1.45% and a vote percentage from 
percent to 1.43 percent, and the quota percentage of South Korea from uh, 0.77 percent to 1.35 percent, and the vote percentage from uh, 0.76 percent to 1.33 percent, and both the quota percentage and and uh, uh, the uh, vote percentage of Turkey were increased from 0.45 percent to 0.55 uh, percent during this uh, individual increase of quota shares. And as a second step of the reform, the resolution of 2006 required of the Board of Governors to make further rules on quotas and, and voting powers by 2008. So on that basis, the 2008 resolution adopted a new quota formula. A new quota formula. We can take a look at this uh, this formula. Uh, basically, this new formula has four variables expressed in uh, all of the four variables are expressed in shares of global totals. Uh, these four variables are GDP. Uh, openness, variability, and reserves, and reserves, with, uh, with different, uh, different weights attached to them. Uh, with that, uh, uh, the weights are 50% for GDP, 30% for openness, 15% uh, for variability, and 5% for reserves. And, uh, you can, you can, uh, take a look at, uh, that, how these variables are, are measured, are expressed. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit technical, um, so we just take a brief look at it and have a basic understanding of this. That's, that's enough. Um, one thing that I uh, uh, want to, uh, in particular, point out is that now the GDP variable in this formula is no longer completely based on a measure on the basis of market exchange rates. It's now a blend of, of uh, GDP measured at, by market exchange rates and by TDP. That's a big, big uh, change uh, and, and a big, uh, I'd say a big victory for developing countries. Uh, now, GDP measured at the basis, uh, on the basis of market exchange rates occupies 60 percent of, uh, of, of, of the GDP and uh, those mar uh, and that measured by GDP occupies uh, 40 percent and, and it's a blend, so, so the GDP variable is a blend of, of these two, of these two. Uh, according to the IMF, this approach this planned calculation of GDP captures the central role of quotas in its financial operations for which GDP at the market exchange rates is the most relevant, as well as its non-financial activities where PPP GDP can be viewed as a relevant way to capture the relative volume of goods and services produced by economies. Um, this is the official explanation of the MF. And actually, uh, developing countries, emerging markets have endeavored to, uh, make an even more, uh, aggressive change to the GDP calculation. That is to, to make the calculation totally based on, on, uh, PDP. But, uh, the result is a compromise between developing countries and, uh, developing, developing countries. Um, so, um, Based on this new formula, based on this new calculation uh, method, the Board of Governors further increased the quotas of 55 members. Uh, these members are many emerging market economies uh, with a total increase of 20 billion SDRs. And according to the MF, taken together the actions in 2006 and 2008, um, the quota percentage of the beneficiary members uh, I mean, many emerging market economies uh, have been have been increased by 4.9 percent. And another part of the 2008 resolution uh, was the increase of the number of political votes. 
that that was a radical uh, uh, increase. Uh, the number of uh, bicycle boats was uh, increased from 250 uh, to 750, that is, triples. Uh, bicycle boats uh, have been tripled. And besides, besides the tripling of the bicycle boats, uh, the percentage, the ratio of bicycle boats to the total boats uh, uh, was uh, locked, was locked by the resolution, which means whenever the total votes increases, uh, for example, by a general increase of quotas, for, uh, whenever, I mean, the quota shares increases, the basic votes will be increased in ac uh, accordingly because the percentage, percentage is, uh, is locked, is locked. Uh, after, after the tripling of votes, based on the new percentage of basic votes, uh, as against the total votes, the ratio will be locked. Uh, this is actually the first time since the foundation of the IMF that the basic votes have been uh, increased, have been increased. And the lock of the ratio of basic votes to uh, the total votes is also a big achievement for, for those uh, countries with, uh, 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 I mean, fewer, uh, with, 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 uh, especially for those poor, poorest countries with uh, uh, not made in basic votes. The lock of the ratio is, is really a, a big thing. And this is basically the uh, major contents of, uh, of, of the 2008 resolution, which has already taken effect. And how about the 2010 resolution? Uh, the 2010 resolution is, um, basically has uh, also has two uh, parts, has two parts. The first is about the quota transfer, quota transfer. Uh, here we have a sequence of relevant events. Uh, actually, the G20, uh, the G20, I guess that's the third G20 summit held in Pittsburgh in September 2009. Uh, decided to uh, transfer 5% of the uh, uh, IMF quotas shares from over-represented developing countries to under-represented developing countries. Uh, the deadline made by the leaders was uh, January, 20, uh, January 2011. January 2011. But since the work of the transfer is quite complicated and time consuming, and uh, uh, during the process it turned out that uh, it was impossible, actually impossible to be finished on time, uh, the G20 financial ministers and the central bankers meeting in October 2010 once again uh, decided to uh, finish the transfer of quotas by 2012, that is uh, next year, postpone the deadline uh, until next year, and it decided to increase the percentage of transfer from 5% to 6%. And on November 5th, 2011, just before the commencement of the G20 Seoul Summit, that is the fifth, uh, uh, the fourth, the fourth, the fourth, uh, the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, the fifth uh, G20 Summit, uh, held in Seoul, the IMF Executive Board approved the package on the reform of quotas and governance, and the Board of Governors passed a resolution uh, to that effect on December 15, uh, 2010. Uh, basically, basically, the uh, 2010 resolution decided to double the total quotas of IMF from uh, 200 38.4 billion SDRs to 476.8 SDRs, um, so as to increase its lending resources. Um, as uh, 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 I mean, highlighted by, by by the crisis, financial crisis, and to enhance its crisis management capacity, and also to effect the transfer of uh, uh, quota shares. Uh, besides the doubling of total quotas. 
the resolution also decides to uh, put effect to the decision of the uh, G20 meeting, that is, to transfer 6 to, uh, 6% of quota shares from over-represented members to under-represented mem uh, under members. Uh, that, together with the 2008 resolution, which has already taken effect, the total transfer of shares uh, to emerging market economy and developing countries would reach 9%. 9%. Um, half of the transfer shares come from developed countries, many from European countries, and one third from OPEC countries, the uh, petroleum exportation countries. Only less than 10% uh, are from other emerging market economy. So uh, actually, uh, the uh, emerging market economies uh, especially the so-called dynamic emerging market economies are the uh, biggest beneficiary of these uh, product transfers. Um, meanwhile, a special committee will be established to take care of the quotas of the poorest countries. Uh, what, what, it, what does the poorest country mean? Uh, it means country with a per capita annual income of less than 1,000 and 135 US dollars one year. These first countries will be taken care of by a special committee established uh, uh, later. Um, and this, this committee will, will take care of these countries but to see if their rights and requirements are, are sufficiently met and may make special interests to their quotas on an individual basis uh, when circumstances so require. And this is, this is the first part of the 2010 resolution. And the second part of the uh, 2010 resolution is the reform of the executive board. And first, um, the size of executive direct, uh, executive board will remain the same, that is, two, uh, 24 directors, but the number of directors representing advanced European countries, developed European countries, will be reduced by two. Will be reduced by two. That is, there will be only six uh, executive directors on the board to represent the developed European countries. Um, and the reduced two uh, directors will then be elected by emerging market economies and developing countries. That is, a sh actually, a shift of, of uh, shares from uh, uh, European countries to uh, emerging market economies. And second, after the reform package takes effect, the composition, the makeup of the, the makeup of the executive boards will be reviewed every eight years. I should say if it's, uh, if it's proper, every eight years. This is uh, uh, the second thing. And the third and most uh, important uh, part of the reform on the exec executive board is that uh, after the, ref uh, the resolution takes effect, all the directors, all the executive directors will be elected, will be ele elected. The history of appointed directors will be ended, will be ended. Uh, the Board of Governor will further make regu regulations to govern the conduct of the election so as to avoid an excessive concentration of voting power in multi-country constituencies on the one hand and to allow for adequate flexibility to enable members to form constituencies on a voluntary basis on the other hand. So uh, specific regulations by laws that are uh, meant to be uh, 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 formulated by the Board of Governors. So, what will happen after the 2010 resolution takes effect? What will happen? Uh, uh, I'll uh, list some of the, 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 the changes. Um, first, China, the quotas and the voting power of the emerging markets, economies, and, uh, and uh, developing countries in IMF will be further increased. For example, uh, China will have its quota shares and voting shares increased to 6.394% and 6.071% respectively, and will become the third largest shareholder of the IMF 
next only to the United States and Japan. Uh, furthermore, all the BRICS four countries, that is Brazil, Russia, India, and China, will all be among the top ten shareholders of the IMF. And together with the four largest European countries, that is France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom, as well as the US and Japan, the total the top ten shareholders will really represent the top ten economies in the world. The ranking of the countries will be more close to their ranking in the global economy. I also have a table here, table here to show the, uh, po the quotas and the votes uh, that the United States, China, and Mexico will hold um, after the 20... Uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. There should be... Made, uh, should be um, Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, the, the title is okay, but the table, the table, I, I forgot to um, attach a note to the table. It, it shows the quotas um, and the votes the three countries will have after the 2010 resolution takes effect. We can say all, uh, both China and Mexico will have, will have an interest in, its, uh, in their quotas and the votes. Um, and the United States, uh, a small decrease, a small decrease, but still, but still, um, uh, uh, more than 16% of, uh, of, uh, voting power. Um, that, that is the, uh, uh, major, uh, contents of the two uh, important resolutions of 2008 and 2010. Now let's take a brief look at the achievements and the limitations of the reform of these two uh, resolutions. Uh, first, um, it has to be admitted that uh, the reforms taken so far uh, had uh, important meanings. Important meanings. Um, uh, actually, it's um, it's. Uh, Contributed to the um, the more balanced governance structure, a more balanced power structure within the, this organization. Although the IMF as an international financial organization based on the capital majority rule uh, is different from many other international organizations, it is indeed an organization made up of sovereign states. Therefore, it must respect and observe the recognized principles of democratic politics and international rule of law, and must represent and protect the rights and interests of all its members as widely as possible. Or else its legitimacy and uh, fairness will be unavoidably be questioned. It might even, um, in my opinion, turn into a mouthpiece of a type of wealthy countries or certain superpowers. That's a basic understanding of me, uh, of, of the uh, IMF. Um, in fact, in fact um, as we all know, even a business corporation under the private law are required to have, a, a, to have in place a reasonable corporate governance structure uh, to protect the rights and interests of minor shareholders, to prevent excessive control or manipulation uh, of the corporation by the majority shareholders, and to embody the spirit of fairness, equity, and equality before law. As an organi international organization on the public international law, there is all the more reason for the MS to improve on its internal governance so as to ensure that each of its members, um, quotation mark, enjoys the rights inherent in full sovereignty as announced by the Declaration on Principles of International Law. Um, uh, in this sense, in this sense, the reforms made uh, uh, since 2008 uh, through the two resolutions are definitely a significant step in the right direction. In the words of the former managing director, Stuart Khan, who had resigned due to um, an infamous event, um, the 2010 reform package, quotation mark, 
is the most fundamental governance overhaul in the fund's 65-year history and the biggest ever shift of influence in favor of emerging markets and the developing countries to recognize their growing role in the global economy. Although as, uh, as the man who actually uh, pushed these reforms, uh, Mr. Collins' uh, uh, representation might need to be taken with a, with a uh, spoon of salt. Still, um, there is no denial that uh, these reforms uh, actually uh, gave developing countries uh, some benefits and, and contribute to the uh, to have a more balanced IMF. These these are the achievements of these reforms, in my opinion. Uh, with this being said, with these uh, comments uh, being made, uh, still there are uh, significant limitations uh, in these reforms taken so far. Uh, let's let's take a look at some of them. Uh, first, first uh, of all. Um, it has not resolved all the problems relating to the voting power and the governance structure and, and it did not touch some of the core uh, elements of this uh, system. The most, notably, uh, the most notable thing is that even after the 2010 resolution takes effect, the quotas of the United States will still be more than 17% and its voting shares will still be more than 16%, which means that even after the 2010 uh, package takes effect, um, still the United States uh, will have its uh, single de facto veto power over the significant issues of this organization. And also, and also, um, the a major uh, a major deficiency in, in this reform is that uh, it fails to make specific provisions for the selection of IMF senior officials, including the managing director. Uh, actually, uh, many countries have uh, argued for a uh, uh, explicit, explicit rule governing the selection of. Uh, of, uh, of uh, high officials, but uh, the 2010 resolution failed to include in it a, a uh, rule or uh, a, a regulation on to that effect. To that effect, uh, considering the efficiencies in the representation and selection of the MF senior officials, the G20 Toronto Summit had planned to strengthen the legitimacy and the credibility of MF and to ensure um, an open, transparent, and merit-based merit selection of the IMF management, but the 2010 resolution said nothing specific in that respect. In that respect. Um, here we, we, have a, we have an important, uh, I actually have a vivid example. Actually, as a matter of fact, after the resignation of Mr. Sturton, we have uh, uh, expected to have a new managing director from non-European countries uh, to actually end the unwritten uh, tradition of uh, uh, only Europeans can be the uh, uh, leader of, uh, of, of, of IMF. And, and uh, uh, we all know that uh, the Mexican uh, central banker, uh, Mr. Uh, Arthur Tustins, actually ran for, for the uh, uh, position, position, but unfortunately, in the end, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he was defeated by his uh, French counterpart, uh, Miss uh, Christine Martin Lagarde. So uh, we have we have to have another French managing director of the IMF uh, 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 in IMF. Uh, this is quite actually this process is quite interesting because because uh, in the end in the end. Um, Mr. Oxygen uh, Customs only got, got uh, support from uh, uh, many from Latin America uh, area. And even within Latin America area, Brazil supports uh, uh, Ms. Lagarde. And, and, and in the end, uh, 
uh, both Vashra and Churna uh, support, ha, ha, have supported uh, 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 the French candidates. So it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. I'm, I'm not quite so clear of, the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of why this has happened, but one thing uh, that is clear is that uh, the developing countries, the emerging market economies as a whole, uh, uh, especially the BRICS countries still uh, has many things to do to really uh, be united as, uh, and can talk in a, in a uh, uniform voice in terms of these uh, important things. That might still, uh, uh, I mean, they still have, have a long way to go in this, uh, in this sense. And in addition to another, uh, to, to a new a managing director, uh, another French uh, uh, managing director. Uh, the first deputy managing director will continue to be uh, a U.S. citizen, a citizen. Uh, Mr. David Nipton, who is now the special assistant to the managing di director, will replace his uh, uh, countryman, uh, Mr. John Lipsky, as the first deputy director of, uh, of uh, MF. Um, and, and as some of you might have known uh, a, a Chinese, uh, Mr. Jumin, uh, has been appointed by, by uh, Ms. Lagarde as uh, uh, a deputy director of uh, the NF, who, who is ranked uh, fifth, who is, who is the fifth uh, deputy director, and so is ranked fifth in the uh, IMF hierarchy. Um, this means we have to wait for at least another five years uh, after, uh, I mean, which is the term of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the term of, of for the managing director to see a real change to the traditional power structure in, in, in the uh, highest leadership of the uh, MF. Um, with this, I, I want to make some uh, uh, suggestions to for possible future reforms uh, in uh, on the uh, governance structure of uh, of NF. Uh, in my opinion, possible further reforms might include uh, these things. First, uh, uh, it might be needed to set up an automatic quota adjustment mechanism on the basis of the current quota formula, and to make uh, uh, to make uh, more timely adjustment to the quota shares, to the voting powers, based on its uh, uh, real economic strength and influence in the world economy. And second, it might be needed to make a thorough review of the articles of uh, agreement uh, to reduce on a reasonably possible basis those issues which require a special majority vote to decide, especially those uh, issues requiring and make five uh, special majority, uh, each five percent special majority vote to decide, so as to lessen the excessive control of the IMF by certain superpowers. Uh, since the uh, de facto veto power will still, re uh, will still be there, um, we, another way to, to do this might be to reduce the issues that need to be uh, uh, decided uh, by a 85% special vote. Um, of course, that's still quite a tough job, still a tough job, because uh, the um, um, uh, United States might, might just strike down any kind of these uh, uh, reforms, reforms. And third, and third um, it is necessary to establish and maintain a really open transparent and merit-based selection process for the management and meaningfully breaks the, the European monopoly over the leadership of IMF. Um, um, these are uh, some of the possible f uh, f uh, future reforms that might be, ta uh, might be taken in the future. And as a concluding remark, I want to um, point out that, uh, uh, in my opinion, this round of reform is to a great extent pushed or driven by the financial crisis, by the global financial and economic crisis, which has uh, 
undermines the economic strength of traditional developing countries, especially the European countries, and placed the emerging market economies uh, at the front stage and a more advantageous position. Um, as a crisis-driven reform, although developed countries as a whole have been forced by the circumstances to make some concessions to the developing countries, they are not in a position to compromise their core interest in IMF, um, so, uh, which we have seen uh, uh, just now. In terms of reforming and reshaping the IMF, the international society still has a long way to go. Um, in this process, in this uh, um, important and uh, tough process, uh, Mexico and China, both are important emerging market economies um, in the world, um, ought to, and in fact, are able to play a more meaningful and important role. And with this, I will end my presentation today. Thank you for your time and patience. Si tienen alguna pregunta, por favor, si son tan amables, nos las pasen en esas tarjetitas. Y eh, mientras eh, se preparan preguntas y respuestas, eh, algunas, algunos comentarios. Eh, evidentemente no quiero eh, rebasar las, la exposición de, del profesor, pero eh, tomemos en cuenta que el, el orden mundial creado después de... Eh, 1945, a partir de 1945 con la Segunda Guerra Mundial, tiene como eje fundamental precisamente la creación de una, eh, en principio, triada eh, de organizaciones internacionales de carácter económico, el Fondo Monetario Internacional, el Banco Mundial y el GATT. Sí, lo interesante de esto eh, es, y lo menciona también el profesor Liao, es que fueron creadas eh, después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, en 1945, y además con una estructura basada en instituciones financieras privadas, ¿no? Ese es eh, lo interesante de esta exposición. Es eh, ni más ni menos que en el caso del Fondo Monetario Internacional, donde enfoca su plática, eh, fue creada eh, como un banco más, ¿no?, y, y eh, tanto en su composición como en su manera de decidir esa era la, esa es la era y es la estructura. Ahora bien, lo que no menciona el, el profesor, y eso es lo, lo dramático de la situación, eh, después del fin de la Guerra eh, Fría, eh, fundamentalmente, y a principios del siglo, es que las decisiones del Fondo Monetario Internacional, que les digo, eso no lo toca el, el profesor, han sido eh, en algunos casos dramáticas, ¿no? Es decir, en caso de de problemas financieros, como él mencionaba en, en algún momento en su plática, la, la crisis mexicana, recuerden ustedes el efecto tequila, de la, la crisis rusa, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, el, el Fondo Monetario Internacional toma una participación eh, en donde hay una receta, ¿no? Una receta eh, en donde definitivamente se reestructuran la, las economías internas. Y, y siempre con la base de... Eh, de modelos específicos que hay que ver de dónde, de dónde surgen. Las recetas son, eh, que las conocemos bien en nuestros países, es eh, reducir el gasto público, reducir la estructura del gobierno, eh, la privatización de, eh, de las industrias estatales eh, y orientar más a um, eh, la economía al sector privado en términos generales. Y eso, como, como, hemos, como estamos viendo en este momento, hay un eh, verdadero impacto. Hay un verdadero impacto en, eh, en las economías internas. Eh, esto, eh, evidentemente, ha producido una, una serie de, de, de problemas internos que ahorita en este momento se están manifestando, inclusive a nivel de carácter social. Eh, ahora bien, eh, ¿cuál es el funcionamiento del el Fondo Monetario Internacional? Como lo, lo, lo estamos viendo, eh, eh, es un, 
porque son organizaciones de carácter plutocrático, la estructura está hecha para que los países desarrollados, económicamente fuertes después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, eh, mantengan el control y además eh, eh, dentro de la estructura tienen un dominio. Eh, esto me hace recordar una anécdota que hace, hace unos años eh, con el profesor Thomas Frank, eh, eh, en una plática eh, profesor estadounidense que él, él manejaba la, eh, el impacto de los países subdesarrollados y cuando yo le hacía una cuestión le, le preguntaba oiga profesor usted dice que, que eh, los países subdesarrollados participan en, en la conformación del derecho internacional y del funcionamiento de las estructuras internacionales pero cuando eh, los países subdesarrollados como como fue el caso en 1971, eh, presentan un plan de reestructuración de la economía internacional, eh, lo consideran como una mera eh, resolución de la Asamblea General y es una mera recomendación. Entonces, ¿dónde está el impacto? Entonces, él me contestó de forma muy aguda. Me dice, ¿cómo quiere usted que los países subdesarrollados impongan modelos económicos internacionales cuando a nivel interno sus economías no funcionan. Ahora esto hay que traerlo a colación, es decir, ¿cómo queremos que Estados Unidos imponga modelos económicos internacionales cuando sus economías también hacen agua? Es interesante la situación. En, el, el, en la exposición de, de, del profesor eh, Liao eh, nos habla de las reformas eh, del año 2008, y al final dice no, no son no son suficientes y en efecto no son no son suficientes eh, se necesita algo más pero eh, los factores de poder a nivel internacional eh, eso nos puede decir otra cosa es decir, eh, creo que eh, para una posibilidad de reformas de instituciones como estas y como es Naciones Unidas el Consejo de Seguridad que son instrumentos que se han quedado rebasados por la realidad eh, eh, se necesita algo más que las meras intenciones. Eh, él manifiesta la posibilidad de Cartens llegar a, a, a la presidencia del Fondo Monetario Internacional. No sé cuál haya sido el impacto o si Cartens eh, traía la estafeta de los países subdesarrollados. No, 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 no lo creo. Eh, eh, sí, por supuesto se rompe un monopolio. Eh, y, y una regla no escrita, como el profesor eh, lo menciona, una regla no escrita de que los países europeos son los que manejen la institución. Pero antes de que se, se vayan todos, este es mi, última, <ríe> mi último comentario, creo que se necesita un poquito más de eh, una voluntad de, de ciertos países y creo que es necesario una, eh, en eso sí una reconformación de, las, de, las, de los grupos internacionales. ¿no? Yo creo que un país solo o dos países solos no lo pueden hacer. Eh, está hablando de BRICS, por ejemplo. Está hablando del grupo de los 20, donde está, donde está, donde está México. Eh, creo que a nivel de grupos podrían eh, empujar hacia reformas eh, fundamentales eh, de la Organización Económica Internacional. ¿Alguna cosa, Ricardo? Bueno, eh, insisto, antes de que nos quedemos solos, como dice el maestro Vallarta en, en el concierto de que se quedan los músicos tocando solos, ¿no? eh, eh, Sinfonía de la Dios de Haydn, vamos a, entonces, ya le dimos un poco de tiempo al profesor para que se traduzcan las eh, cuestiones. Eh, ¿Por qué no la lee usted en español, Diego? La primera pregunta es realizada por el profesor José Luis Vallarta. ¿Es el Fondo Monetario Internacional una institución oriented institution? ¿Cómo se ¿Una institución orientada a la ganancia? Ok. ¿Y es posible para un país... Es posible, es posible que un país tenga más poder para votar dando más dinero al Fondo Monetario Internacional. 
Thank you, Professor Vyaska, for your wonderful questions. Um, the first question is, is the IMF a profit-oriented institution? I would say basically it's not a profit-oriented institution. Although it, when it makes loans to, to uh, sovereign countries, it uh, will uh, ask for a interest to, when repaying the loan. But the real focus of the loans are not on, on, on the interest, interest rate, but on the conditions attached to these uh, uh, loans, um, which is by, this loan, by accepting these loans, you have to, the seven country has to make uh, substantial reforms uh, to their economic structure, to the public spending, according to what the MF wants it to do. And this is the so-called conditionality of MF loans, which, which has actually caused a lot of problems in the past. Because the MF uh, actually, um, uh, especially in, in the 1980s and 1990s, it was actually controlled, uh, uh, virtually controlled by, by the United States and by the European countries, particularly by the United States. These conditions attached to the IMF loans actually um, embodied the uh, will, the uh, way of thinking of the IMF, or in more accurate words, the so-called Washington Consensus, which was actually uh, Sharply criticized by some scholars, among which the uh, most outstanding uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Joseph Stiglitz. Mm. So, well, I, uh, in my opinion, uh, IMF might be not a profit-oriented institution, but um, the condition, conditionality, may ha even have uh, worse uh, effect. That's the answer to your first question. And your second question is, is it possible for a country to have a more vote power by giving more money to the MF? And the answer is basically no, because um, the distribution of quota shares uh, is based on the, the so-called quota formula, um, which is uh, initially created by the United States in 1944 and, and was amended uh, uh, twice. And uh, in 2008, uh, we have a new formula, and the distribution of shares, or how many shares you can have, you can contribute to the organization, uh, is limited by this uh, formula, by, by this uh, uh, calculation. And you cannot just say, I, I want to donate more money to you, and you give me more uh, shares. That's not possible. That's not possible. But another way of uh, giving resources to the MF is you can uh, buy the bonds of MF. Uh, uh, in history, MF uh, didn't issue any bonds, but after the crisis, in order to increase its uh, lending resources to manage the crisis, it has issued uh, a, 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 a issued a special bonds. I guess the uh, the, the maximum amount is uh, over uh, 2,000 billion US dollars. And, and by subscribing to, to the bonds, you can contribute money to the, to the uh, organization. But as bond, similar to bondholders, it's not like shareholders. You cannot have voting powers because of the, uh, the, your purchase of the bonds. Basically, that's my answer to your two questions. La segunda pregunta la realiza Luis Orsi. Yes. ¿Cuáles son las posibilidades de cambio en el papel central del dólar americano en el sistema monetario? Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Orsi. Um, this is really a very good question. Very, very good question. How, uh, what are the possibilities of the change 
in the central role of the US dollar in the monetary, international monetary system. Yeah, that's um, actually um, what I have been researched in, in, in uh, recently. It is really a big, big issue uh, after the financial crisis. Um, my presenting my answer is in currently and in the near future, we just have no answer to this question. To this question, because so, um, to change the central role of dollar U.S. dollar in the international monetary system, you have to have a substitute. You have to have a substitute to replace. But uh, sorry, uh, somebody says that the uh, Chinese uh, Yuan is yeah, going yeah. to be the okay. I'll go the to new. I go to it. Um, you have to have a substitute, and the possible substitute we can say first is the so-called uh, uh, extra sovereignty or super sovereignty, uh, super sovereign currency, uh, which uh, uh, is maybe the SDR's special drawing rights of the IMF. But since the uh, creation of the IMF in 1970s or 1960s, I have to check. Since its creation in 1960s or 70s, it actually its functions have been very limited to official transactions within the, uh, the MF. It has not been a wide used currency that as as the dollar, as, as euro, uh, as as uh, anything else. So, um, uh, in theory, in theory, a super sovereign currency would be uh, optimal. To, for I mean for countries because uh, you don't have to worry about a conflict between the function of a international currency, a world currency, and and the special interests attached to this currency. You have to worry about that. But it's very very difficult to to put into practice a super sovereign uh, currency. Actually, uh, before the uh, I guess before the second second. Uh, uh, G20 summit in London in 2008, um, the central banker, uh, president of uh, China, the Bank of China, uh, Mr. Zhu Xiaochuan, has proposed to uh, to the, propose the creation of a super sovereign currency. But that, in my opinion, was more than a uh, uh, demonstration of uh, of uh, determination to the United States to get a, I mean, better fee to get more bargain power for, for the uh, summit rather than a serious uh, consideration of uh, in this uh, uh, direction. So, I mean, super sovereign currency not possible in, 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 the, in the near future. And another point may be Euro. And actually, the creation of Euro was actually a big, big challenge to, to the U.S. dollars uh, in, the past, in the past. But a big problem with the Euro is that it does not have a uniform fiscal uh, agency behind it. it I mean, uh, European, the, uh, the Eurodome has a uh, uniform monetary uh, policy, but it does not have a uniform fiscal policy, which means what? Which means you can control how much money the member countries issue, but you cannot control how many money the member governments stand for how many days it incurred. That's basically one of the most important reasons why the great debt crisis has occurred, because the great government incurred so many debts beyond its repay capacity. Uh, I guess we we have all known the uh, the uh, European sovereign debt crisis in recent days. It has been actually escalated. So. Um, uh, people are, are talking about a, a eurozone bond, talking about a uh, joint fiscal policy, but we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. So euro in the, if you, in, in the near future is, is quite um, uh, infeasible. And, and, and yuan, and yuan, I I would like to say yuan <laughs> become an international currency or even world currency because at least I don't have to I mean convert into 
donor or pistol before I, I come here and give me much convenience, but it's uh, not feasible in the near future. Why? To be an international currency, not to mention world currency, you have to be, you have to be as a precondition, free convertible. Completely free, free convertible. But, we, what does completely free convertible mean? It means you have to open both your current account and your capital account. But now, but now China has only opened its capital, uh, its, its current account, which means you can convert RMB freely when you, when you're doing trade, when you're doing, uh, direct for investment with China. But you cannot convert RMB freely, uh, when it concerns capital issues. For example, you cannot, you cannot buy, uh, Chinese, uh, stock. You cannot buy Chinese bond with RMB. So, and, 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 and it's, this situation is not going to change in the near future because Chinese government is much concerned with the risk, the potential risk associated with the opening up of capital accounts, uh, which has been verified by the 1997 Asian crisis and also by the 2008 financial crisis. So in, in the near future, the capital account will not be able to be open, which makes a precondition for a, for being a international currency, uh, does not exist. But, but my hope, and I guess it's also the hope of, uh, of, uh, many Chinese, uh, or even the government is, we will, we will, um, gradually lose the control of the capital control according to specific circumstances and, 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 uh, uh, to make RMB, uh, internationalized as far as, uh, as soon and as far as possible. Thanks. Una tercera pregunta, no tiene nombre, eh, es, ¿cuál es la posición y situación del Fondo Monetario Internacional en relación con la crisis estadounidense? Uh, thank you for the question. It's on numbers. Um, what is the position and the situation of the IMF about the USA crisis? Well, it's, it's really a good question. Uh, actually, a big critic of, uh, of the IMF, both from inside and from outside, is that um, the IMF didn't do a good job uh, in terms of uh, monitoring the uh, U.S. economic and financial situation and in preventing the IMF, uh, USA crisis from breaking out. And in my opinion, a big reason for this failure of function is that um, in the past decades, in the past decades, the IMF has uh, paid too much attention uh, in terms of supervising the monitoring, too much attention to developing countries and too little attention to developing countries. A basic assumption of this organization is that the developing countries, they have developed capital markets, they have sophisticated financial system, they are, I mean, I mean, they are good enough to take care of themselves. And this has made the IMF, uh, do not pay enough attention in their monitoring of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the situation of developing countries, especially of, of the uh, United, States, United States. And this also, this failure of function, this imbalance in terms of uh, monitoring and supervision also, mirror, uh, also, also uh, indicates the imbalanced power structure, governance structure in this organization. Because this decision-making body, the executive board, is was mainly controlled by the developing countries when, this, when deciding what things to do, when deciding what measures to take in, it, it is only natural that they will focus their attention on other people rather than on themselves. So they, in, in this sense, this uh, uh, imbalanced supervision is, uh, in, in my opinion, is, uh, uh, is only natural and, and it also, uh, uh, the, uh, in my opinion, a focus of, uh, future uh, reform. Thanks. 
Y la última pregunta, realizada por el doctor Eugenio García Flores. ¿Qué funciones específicas podría tener el Comité para Países en Vías de Desarrollo? Uh, thanks for the question. What specific functions could the committee? I, I suppose it's, uh, it means the special committee uh, established by, by, by the two, uh, to be established by the 2010 resolution. What specific functions could the committee have regarding developing countries? Uh, it's from Mr. Garcia. Thanks. Um, actually, this special committee. Um, uh, To be frank, I don't know if it has already been established. Uh, maybe not because uh, the, uh, I guess not because the, uh, the resolution still needs to take effect. But uh, the basic function of this uh, special committee is to take care of the poorest countries. Uh, because poorest countries, they have uh, uh, minimal share, uh, uh, could share in the organization and uh, very few votes in organization. Uh, the function of the special committee would, would be to uh, pay special attention to these poorest countries to say if their requirements and, and, and needs are fully or at least reasonably met by the distribution of quotas and, and, and votes and might do some uh, special increase of, uh, of quotas on an individual basis to these countries and might have special rules of uh, calculating uh, quota shares, calculating votes, so as to uh, make a more balanced and more fair and equitable distribution of, of shares uh, with regard to these uh, poorest or least developed countries. That basically would be the function of, of this committee. Of course, uh, specific regulations, specific rules, uh, I guess, will need to be Uh, further formulated after the committee is uh, actually established. Thanks. Bueno, pues eh, muchísimas gracias nuevamente, muchas gracias al profesor de, eh, Liao y muchas gracias a ustedes por su atención y eh, inteligentes y excelentes preguntas. Buenas tardes. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.